Okay. Good morning again, everyone, and uh, welcome back to Bible study. Uh, let's just jump right in. Um, if you'll remember last week, we did the parable of the tenants, uh, and we talked about, um, you know, you have to be careful of how you interpret some of these parables and how this parable in particular has been interpreted over the centuries by Christians to justify anti-Semitism uh, and, and the persecution of Jews, uh, because it was interpreted as a parable in which um, God had entrusted to the Jews all uh, that he wanted to, well, all that he wanted them to be, that he sent prophets to teach them to do the right thing, and they killed all the prophets, and then they he sent his son and they killed his son. And uh, as a result, God would take away the vineyard from the Jews and give it to the Christians. Um, and how that was a very dangerous interpretation of the, of the parable because of historically what it has done. Uh, and that a, a, a more appropriate, one more appropriate, there are a variety of ways of interpreting parables, would be to say that the parable um, is really more about religious leaders and and how God entrusts religious leaders uh, to guide his people and that if they do not uh, do so appropriately, uh, he will take that leadership away from them and and trust uh, others uh, to to be his leaders, uh, which is much less than of an anti-Semitic interpretation because you then don't attribute all of it to all Jews and therefore justify persecuting all Jews. Um, well, well, let me say this on this topic. And I was thinking about it and you, you know, you're right. The leadership came out. It wasn't all the people that was trying to do that. Uh, as we know, when he came in here, the people were, you know, with him. But the leadership speaks for the people. Sort of like, um, Biden speaks for us as Americans. So just like when Trump was in and uh, the leader, whatever he said and did made people around the world hate us because we're Americans and because of what they say. So the leadership may have started, you know, this, but the way the world sees it, the leadership were Jewish. And so if the leadership was Jewish, then let me condemn he they speak for the people so let me condemn all the people just like our presidents past and forward speak for us and the world either loves us or hates us because of what they say what they do in their politics but but is that an appropriate response in other no, words so we, right no. you, you shouldn't hate all of the people because of what the leaders are doing I, and you're right. And, and, right. and, you know, you're right. And I'm not saying that that's the right thing to do, but that's how people do. They interpret it, you know, as all, all of us. And right. that's right. what the, um, they believe that if the leadership is saying this is what happened, then they incorporate all of us. So if we go to a, a foreign country that um, that's against Americans, then they take it out on us, even though we may not have a clue of what the president politics are. But it's taken out just like now. Um, when President uh, Trump called the virus the Chinese flu, now all Asians are being persecuted because they consider them responsible when they are American born. American-born Asians are living in fear because of what somebody called the Chinese flu, and and people in their mixed-up minds take that as okay. You look like them, so whether they're Vietnamese, Japanese, or whatever, they're Asians. They taking it out on them because our leadership said it came from them, and 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 which is wrong, which makes them. Uh, haters, you know, of right. that nationality. Okay, and that's that's the point that when you interpret the parable here, you you it would be inappropriate to interpret it as applying to all of the people, 
when in fact it's really directed at just the leaders. Um, so, <clears throat> so that was the whole point of 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 doing that, so that we, we don't fall into that. And unfortunately, the the Christians have interpreted this parable for centuries as a reason to justify persecution of the Jews. Um, all right, well, let's move on <clears throat> to the next segment. Um, and uh, so we'll start at verse 13. And who would like to read verses 13 through 17? Don't all jump at once. I'll read, Father. Okay. They sent some Pharisees and Arabian to him to ensure to ensnare him in his speech. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you are not concerned with anyone's opinion. You do not regard a person's status but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or should we not pay? Knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They bought him one, they bought one to him, and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They replied to him, Caesar's. So Jesus said to them, repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. They were utterly amazed at him okay thank you amen to it. so uh first responses initial response to the the passage and now jesus, jesus said to me uh, who, who else was there who else was speaking Loretta. Loretta. Loretta, you go ahead. I was thinking about politics. It, politics came to mind. Um, I was listening to the news uh, this week, and I don't, I don't remember exactly the context, but something stuck with me. He said that uh, politicians come together for two reasons: either they come together for love, or they come together for hate. And so, with the that's when I thought about the Pharisees and the Herodians. Um, they didn't really like each other. They just, um, they just hated Jesus. They didn't like Jesus. Okay. Nothing like a common enemy, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're right. Um, yeah uh, <laughs> well, I was. Um, Ma'am. Yes. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say that uh, this is, to me, where Jesus is telling us God wants your heart and to do good and to love each other. That belong, your spirit and your heart belong to him. It should belong to him. And so if you have money that's something that's of this world, then we and just pay your taxes. You know, I know that the taxes were not just, they were not fair, but don't be so concerned about that. Be more concerned about um, your heart and what's important to God instead of the money. Um, and if, if you can train yourself and focus only on God, or not only, but primarily on God, then the taxes will probably take care of themselves, just like tithing. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> Hi, this is Esther. I had two thoughts when I heard this. 
One is that um, here Jesus is again defending all of these questions while they're attacking him, and he has utterly silenced them because he answers with such wisdom and he recognizes their hypocrisy and he gives them an answer that they cannot respond to. So once again, he's flattened them. And my second thought was um, kind of in line with, and I don't know who just spoke, but it was um, you, you are in the world, but not of the world. We all have to live in this world and we're going to end up paying taxes and all kinds of things that we're going to have to contend with. But the speaker in front of me said, you know, God wants us to live from our hearts. Well, we don't have a choice living in this world, but we do have a choice how we react to certain things in this world. So be in the world, but not of the world. So give to Caesar, pay the taxes, do what you have to do, but always know that God is first in your life. And once you understand that, everything else will follow. So those were my two thoughts. Okay. And that was Gretchen who spoke before you, Esther. Oh, thank you, Gretchen, because I was thinking the same thing of my heart. Hi. (laughs) Okay. Any other uh, thoughts or comments? Well, Esther kind of said some of what I was trying to say, um, but um, as we go back to the beginning, we see that, yeah, you know, they're building him up again. They're trying to puff him up like, you know, uh, at the beginning, you know, we know that you are a truthful man and that you're not concerned with anyone's opinion. You know, I mean, they're trying to put him up on a high pedestal before they throw, uh, throw the dirt at him. And, G, you know, I'm sitting there looking at him. I said, Jesus going, oh, my God. Not this. Is, well, he's not saying, oh, my God. But he's saying, you know, here we go again. Here we go again with this. No matter how many how many times we have gone through this uh, book of John, and, and we, we still see them, uh, Mark, I'm just, we still see them trying to test him. And each time he always asks that question, answer question with a question. And then, uh, just like Esther says, in the end, um, they have nothing to say because now he has stopped them in their tracks and now they got to go back and it's like football. Okay, they don't block me. Now I got to go back and get in the huddle and re-huddle <laughs> something else going on because that's exactly what they keep doing because they keep trying to, you know, they keep trying to make him look bad in the public and make them look like they know what they're talking about and he doesn't know the scriptures like they do. So it really is not about Jesus, it's more about them. As you can see that, it's more about how they want to look in the eyes of the people. And, but, but they're not doing everything they're supposed to do is what Jesus is saying there. And, it, and he asked him, why are you testing me? Really, he ought to be, he, they ought to be testing themselves is what he's really saying. And can I have one more uh, minute to just say that, well, to, to elaborate more on what Dee was saying, um, Jesus doesn't play games, and you can't pull anything over on, on his eyes. And, and sometimes people ask you questions. Oh, I've had this done to me. But people ask questions to steer you in a direction when they, you know, when the answer is obvious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not a genuine question, is it? I mean, it's uh, so let's let's take a look at, at at some of this and see what we can learn from the, the text. Uh, first, I, Loretta's comment was right on point that the Pharisees and the Herodians were not particularly friends with each other. Uh, the Pharisees were. Uh, considered themselves at least very devout Jews um, and following all the rules and everything. And they would not want to be seen at all as sellouts to the Gentile authority, which would have been Rome. Um, You know, they would have seen themselves as separate and apart from the secular world, um, subject only to God. Whereas the Herodians would have been allies with um, King Herod 
And even though King Herod was a Jew, uh, he only was able to rule as king because he was in cahoots with the Romans. So, you know, Rome wasn't weren't fools. They, you only you only could rule if you cooperated with them. So uh, King Herod was able to retain his post as king because he was willing to go along with um, with Rome. And so the Pharisees certainly would have seen the Herodians as sellouts. Um, and so they would not have been allies. Uh, but as Loretta said, um, there's nothing like a common enemy to bring people together. And uh, that's and Jesus is a common en enemy to both the Pharisees and the Herodians. Why? Why is he? A, why is he a potential threat to the Pharisees? And again, really more the Pharisee uh, leaders. Why is he a threat to the Pharisees? He's turning. I believe he's turning the people against them. He's saying he's saying what they what they need him to say, but at the same time, he's telling what's right to the people. Not okay, right. yeah, I mean, he's not, I, I, I can probably say he's not deliberately trying to, you know, overthrow the Pharisees, but he's critiquing the Pharisees. Uh, are the leader, uh, are the, uh, the Jewish uh, religious leaders. The leaders, because remember, there's, there's some evidence that Jesus himself may have been a Pharisee, which just simply meant he was part of that religious group. So it's not all Pharisees. He's going after the leaders and he's criticizing them and that, you know, nobody likes to be criticized. Uh, so if you all started criticizing me, um, you know, we're all Catholics, but, you know, you criticize the way I'm running things, um, you know, then, you know, I, I start feeling defensive and afraid and that I'm going to lose my authority and that kind of stuff. And so, yes, so the Pharisees, um, the Pharisee leaders are concerned about Jesus because he's challenging their authority. Right. How about the Herodians? How do you think the Herodians felt about Jesus? The, the Herodians probably could have returned to the Romans to tell them that Jesus um, was disobedient to pay taxes. Okay, well, yeah, just as a general matter before you get to this passage, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Herodians would have been concerned about whether Jesus is fomenting trouble. Uh, right. And the last thing they want is trouble because that puts them in bad stead with the Romans. Right. Um, they're, they're there because, like you just said earlier, Herodians uh, are puppets of the Romans. So their job is to keep the peace with the, the Jews in that uh, district. And if they don't keep the peace, whoever's in charge, all of a sudden will have a new king there, or the Romans themselves will come in and eradicate them so, and take over. So they are really saying, okay, our job is to keep the peace. If this man is disturbing the peace, um, and the first, uh, the leaders of the Pharisees are concerned that I might have to be along with them so that I can keep also keep my position. Right. Well, the Pharisees are concerned about their religious authority and the Herodians are concerned about their civic civil authority. Right. Exactly. So so Jesus is a threat to both of them um in in what he's teaching and everything like that so then it moves on um as d says and they try to pump them up right um you know you're a truthful man you're not concerned with anyone's opinion you don't regard anyone's status but you teach according to to god and and truth boy when someone starts off a conversation about that with you know about praising and everything what, what do most of us do what I said, oh my God, what do they want? Yeah, brace yourself, right? Something's coming. So, and that's clearly what they're doing. They're, they're you know, they're, they're doing what a lot of us do when we, where we're going to either do something, either we have bad news to deliver or we have, we're trying to be sneaky or manipulative 
Oh, we always yeah. start by praising the person and telling them how wonderful they are, and then uh, then we drop the other shoe, right? So you know, we, yeah. we do that. All our children and grandchildren do that. I'm I'm the best grandma <laughs> in the world when they want to. You know, all, it happens yep. to each and every one of us. Yep, and I I mean I just kind of always amused by this. I mean, you know, remember this. These scriptures are written two thousand years ago, um, and and you and they're they're capturing human nature as it was then, and here we are two thousand years later, and nothing much has changed in human nature. I mean, that's I think that is just extraordinary that we all should be able to uh, relate to this technique of praising and you know, cajoling someone so that you're getting ready to hit them with something else. Um, so not much has changed in 2000 years in human nature. So then the question is, is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay it or should we not? Um, why is this a trap? Why is this question a tra trap? Why isn't it just a legitimate question? Because they're trying to trap him. But why is it a trap? How how is it a trap? <laughs> they they want to to rest him. They want him to say the wrong thing so he they can lock him up and kill him. Okay, and what's the wrong thing? Yeah, they wanted to um they didn't want to recognize Romans rule as legitimate. Well, well the, the, the trap is this. The trap is this they live in uh they live under Roman rule. So if they don't pay the taxes, then they are violating um, the Roman law. So if the trap is don't don't pay it, if we if we don't pay it, then we get arrested. And the also the trap is the religion part of it. You know, in the religion part of it, do I honor Caesar? Or do I honor God? And that's where the trap is. So if I pay the the, the, the taxes because I'm I'm under Roman law, but I violate my my religious uh, right because I I'm supposed to be under God's law, so they're just trying to trap him in that. Okay, so take a little bit step back and and don't see it in terms of what you do, but remember they're asking him a question, so the trap is going to be in how he answers the question okay, okay. Then, so um, what if happens he if he says yeah what happens if he says it is lawful and what happens if he says it's not lawful well if he agreed the tax should be paid then he would be denying um the god of israel um my question is but didn't they pay Lord taxes sovereignty to other um, jurisdictions, or didn't the Israelites pay taxes like to David, to throughout the kings? Didn't they pay something? Okay, all right, yes, they, they, ha so, they did pay taxes. So the question really is who's levying the tax? Because remember there was a temple tax, uh, the, 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 as you say, David or kings levied taxes on them. So the question so here is, Who's levying the tax? Okay, so this was the first tax to be paid to a civic authority. No, I mean, time? David would have, I mean, you know, David is king and other kings no. would have charged taxes. Yeah. Um, but it's a civic authority, but, but who's civic? <laughs> what, who were they? They were Jewish leaders, right? They, okay. they were Israelites. Who are the who are the Romans? They're not Jews. They're not Jews. And what, what do we call not Jews? Gentiles. Gentiles. All right. So the the question is, is it lawful um, to 
to, uh, you know, support and and al allow yourself to support a Gentile authority over you. Okay. Now, when the issue is, well, lawful in what way, right? Is it if is it civilly lawful or is it religiously lawful to do that? So if, let's start the easy way. If he says no, he shouldn't pay the tax. So if he answers no, what do you what will happen? Okay, he would be a uh, uh, hold on. What do you call it? Um, he would be against Caesar if he says no. And so yeah. they would accuse him, right, of being a rabble rouser, or a, a, a traitor, or a, you know, a, a rebellion, a, a rebel, you know, for for advocating breaking the civil law of Caesar. OK, so if he says, no, it's not lawful for you to pay the tax, um, he he would he's putting himself in a situation where he can be accused of advocating the breaking of the civil law and of of rebelling against caesar right so who's not going to be very happy about that the romans and Caesar. The romans right the romans are not going to be happy if this guy's going around saying don't don't pay the, the roman tax okay the way, the way rome looks at it that every everyone who lives in their jurisdiction is under their uh law therefore they are subject to caesar and they're somehow they're romans even though they don't even though they're jews because no no no, no, no no be careful they're not romans at all i know they're not roman but they're under okay. roman law because they live they're being <laughs> occupied by yeah. Rome. okay yeah. they're 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 not they're not roman citizens right they, they um they're they haven't entered into a treaty with rome mm -hmm. Um, they are occupied by Rome, right? Um, you know, militarily. The Romans so they came are, in. They are, in essence, the prisoners of Rome. Yes, yes. You know, they in their own and took country, over. right? And say, "Give us your money." Uh, right, and if you don't <laughs> give us your money, we'll kill you. Um, yeah, you know, they were their land. They were there. They were occupying the, the land that God gave them. Right. The right. Romans well, came in and took over. Reminds me of the Indians in, in North America. Yep, but, but, exactly. But the, Romans, the Romans still think that they are subject to them because they have occupied them and they have forceful law over them. Right. They're the, the you definitely are subject to to Caesar, but because of his military might, not not because right. of any moral obligation Correct. to them. OK, so now work with that. So now if he says it is lawful to pay the tax. If he just says it outright like that, who would he get in trouble with? He's in trouble with the religious leaders by saying right. that. Right. The religious leaders will then characterize him as being soft on Judaism, right? That 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 he is he is acknowledging the authority of Rome over them. And in fact, Rome has no moral authority over them. Um, but if Jesus says, go ahead and pay their tax, if he just says it that simply, um, they'll, they'll accuse him that he's soft on, on you know, moral and religious grounds, and he'll undermine his credibility with the people. Okay. So that's but, the trap. Go ahead. I have a question. Since they had taken over... Um, Israel, the Romans conquered it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Didn't the Pharisees think that during this period of history for our people, we got to be subject to somebody until the quote unquote zealots come in and the new kingdom comes in and we get a Messiah who's going to change all of this? You know, they, they knew that they were being occupied and they were subject to Roman rule and in order for them to live in some type of peace and harmony in their own land, they were going to have to pay the taxes to the people that had subjugated them. That's you know, right, but that's, a, but that's a compromise. In other words, they're, okay. they're, they're cooperating with these Gentile oppressors 
Um, and, you know, from a religious point of view, that that's problematic um, because you shouldn't cooperate with, uh, you know, Gentile oppressors. You should only you should do what God says to do and be willing to be martyred for the cause. Right. Um, so so if he says, <clears throat> yes, it's lawful to pay the tax, then he could be accused as being soft on religion, right? And, and your loyalty to God. If he says, no, it's not lawful, then he can be accused of, of being, you know, anti Caesar, the government, and could be, um, you know, ended up being arrested and persecuted by the, the Roman um, authorities. Now, knowing their hypocrisy, he says to meet them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. Now, we're going to remember this word hypocrisy. We're going to come back to this, why he thinks they're being hypocrites. Um, what's a denarius? Uh, it's a coin. It's a coin. Yep. It's a coin. You know how much it's worth? A penny. Nope. <laughs> so a denarius whenever you see that term a denarius is basically a day's wage okay oh. so so could this that is be a penny point. well it could be a penny but when we think of a penny we think of one cent um but 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 the denarius would have been whatever a day's wage was um, so its its value, I guess, over time would fluctuate in a sense because it's whatever the value of a day's wage is. Um, but then everything else would be, you know, valuated uh, on that. Um, so so it's it's a value, you know, it's somewhat of a coin, right? If you work all day, um, are you willing to work all day for a penny? No, probably not. So if the minimum wage, let's just for purposes of, of ease of math, if the minimum wage is $10 an hour and a day's work is eight hours, then, uh, you know, a day's wage would be $80, right? So, so that's what this coin is worth. It's worth $80 to us, you know, if, if the minimum wage was $10 an hour. This could be worth even more because based on how much you get paid these days, a denarius could be much more a day's wage. But a denarius is a day's wage, but it's a coin. Okay. Now, what does the coin have on it? The image of Caesar. Caesar's image. Yeah, it has an image and an inscription on it, right? Pretty much like our coins today have. Um, and And whose image is it? Caesars. 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 Okay. Now, let's just talk about that for a minute. Is it problematic to have a coin in your pocket that has Caesar's image on it? Yes, it is. And why? Because it, um, you cannot worship idols. So it, it it's like Caesar being on there. It's like worshiping an idol. Why? All right, you're on the right track. Why is why would the coin be considered an idol? Uh, be, because uh, you recognize you recognize Caesar's um, civil authority when you use a coin. Uh, well, just recognizing Caesar for his civil authority wouldn't make it an idol. What would make it an idol? Worshiping. Um, Worship. You worship it. Yeah, it would be the claim that Caesar is a god. Yes, and they believe he's a god. He, which he was Caesar's god. claim, right? Caesar Augustus considered himself a god. And in fact, the inscription may have said something like that, you know, so that it wasn't just his image, but there may have been an inscription that indicated that he was considered a god. And, and for that reason, the coin could could have taken on the um, status of an idol, right? Does everybody understand that piece? You know that an idol yes. is, is a material thing that you know somehow is related to a god. 
right? So remember the Jews, you were not allowed to make any image, right? That tried to indicate God because that would become an, a, an idol, even if it was the God of Israel. You, you weren't allowed to create an image of the God of, of Israel. Um, so the first step is, does everybody understand how the coin itself from a Jewish perspective could be interpreted as an idol? Any questions about that? Okay. So who does he ask to show him the coin? Leaders? Yeah, he's asking the people who are challenging him, right? The Pharisees and the Herodians. Right. Where do you think they got the coin? <laughs> Romans, they got it in their pocket. <laughs> yeah, they, they reached in their pocket and pulled it out, right? So is there a problem with that? Uh, for the Roman, the Herodian, but it is a problem for the Pharisees to have one available. They should have it. Is or is not a problem. For there is a hypocrisy. <laughs> it's a problem from for the. It to me is not a problem for the Herodians to have one, but it is a problem for the Pharisees. They shouldn't have one in their pocket. Why not? They should be carrying around the idol. So they shouldn't so be carrying should around be idols, right? Right. right. Yeah. So is that their the, hypocrisy? The, the Herodians are Jews, too, so they shouldn't even be carrying idols around, okay? Um, so, um, all right, so so what's the hypocrisy, Gwen? Now, that's what my question was. Is that the hypocrisy, that they would be these people of God with well, this, you, carrying around this idol? So do you think it was immoral for them to carry around the coins, the Roman coins? So I think it would be you know, for them to, to, to no. Well, what are they going to do? I'll say that again. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yourself, there's too much. You are on five mistake. Say that again, Gwen. Unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you mute yourself? Because there's a lot of things. Okay, Gwen, try that again. So, um, I'm saying it sounds very hypocritical for them to approach him with this, um as if they're trying to trap him about about having this idol but yet they have it themselves you know they're carrying around this idol and they're supposed to be these people of god who should not really have this idol but they're using that whole example to try and trap him up do do you they know, have so much of a choice as to whether to use those coins or not no, they no don't. I mean, they have to use that. Uh, Rome was the oppressor, so they have to use the coins to purchase um, right. yeah, things, they... but as long as it doesn't infringe on their service to God, you can carry around the coins, I guess. Okay, so, yeah, so, I mean, they're carrying around the coin is itself a compromise, right? Mm -hmm. um, they they got to live in the world. And, uh, you know, under Roman rule, they can't they can't transact business with something with another coin because no other coin would be recognized. Remember how when they go to the temple, they have to exchange those coins to into shekels so that, yeah. you know, they, they would only use the shekels in the temple. Well, that's the only place a shekel had any value um, was in the temple. But if you're out there, you know, if if you hate. If you live in the United States and and you oppose the current government, um, do you still have a choice as to wh whose currency to use? No, unless you no. move to another country. Unless you move to another country, <laughs> right? So, so the reality is that that the, the Pharisees and Herodians are themselves compromising with with uh, Roman or Gentile rules simply by carrying the coin around. Because in in pure religion, right? They they wouldn't they shouldn't be carrying that coin around. But they got to live in the world, don't they? Yes. Okay. So so as Gwen said, they're ready to trap Jesus by by trying to get him to say he's compromising with Rome if he says yes, right? When in fact they're already compromising with Rome by carrying the coin around. And and what does that make them? It makes them hypocrites. 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 
so so Jesus shows them up immediately by the mere fact that they're carrying around a Roman coin, which they really, if if it was pure religion, they shouldn't be doing it because it's a compromise. Um, and so then how does Jesus then answer the question? I mean, the reality is that we're living in this compromised world, right? Um, and um, and if uh, and and if Caesar's image is on the coin, then who does the coin belong to? Caesar. The coin belongs to Caesar. It belongs to Caesar. So if you're going to have to interact with Caesar, then interact with him according to the way you have to interact with him, right? Um, and whose image? It, who's on whom is God's image on? Uh, it should be on us. Yeah, we're we're the ones that are made in the image of God. Right. Thank so, you, Loretta. So who do we belong to? God. We belong to God. So so what Jesus does? I mean, it's really brilliant. The coin is a coin. It belongs to Caesar and just do with it what you need to in terms of of Caesar. So yeah, if he's if he if he if he's gonna use if he's gonna require you to pay a tax with the coin, then pay the tax. It's his it's his coin. Uh don't get all upset about it. But you belong to God. You should always be living according to God's love and love rule and that's this is very close it's in the gospel of john that he says you know you are in the world not of the world because you don't belong to the world you belong to god right that comes from the gospel of john uh as esther was was talking about earlier this is very much that same teaching you are in the world so you have to live in the world but you are not of the world so don't become one of the world because you don't belong to the world you belong to god and Actually, so he can interact i mean because they occupied they have to um like someone said earlier they have to use um the the roman coin with caesar's image to, to do the everyday business you know like purchasing food or needs everyday needs but remember that this is only uh, to do that the person is what you need to live in that world but you still need to remember that you're god's children and the things that of god you need to continue to do and believe in yeah so it doesn't really answer their question i mean it puts it right back on them um you know because of what belongs to caesar and what belongs to god but he 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 shows them for the hypocrites that they are um and and pretty much you know he he acknowledges that we live in a compromised world um and so sometimes we we have to live according to the ways of the world but in the end remember you always belong to god and you should not behave in any way that would contradict your yourself as a child of god um so, from, so i'm seeing him as having se separated the two things and said don't and saying don't try to mix apples and oranges you know you, you know one is the one of the apples one of the oranges don't mix the apples and the oranges give caesar what's his and you take care of yourself as as um as as belonging to god and that, however, there are times that you have to squeeze some juice from the apple, squeeze some juice from the orange, and then you can try and put the juice together, and that being the compromise. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to know exactly how to how to put it all together because the world is is muddy, right? Um, mm -hmm. But um, it, it it isn't a clear guideline as to what is Caesar's and what is God's, but it's this idea. That in the end, you do not belong to Caesar. You belong to God. Because 
Caesar's image is only on the coin. Caesar's image is not on you. Um, and so make sure you don't take, in essence, take on Caesar's image in your mm -hmm. life. Um, God's image is on you. So Caesar's image is on the coin. God's image is on you. So never forget in whose image you are created. Uh, and, and that always needs to take precedence. You know, and it, it's something that we can use in our everyday life. That there are always challenges. Uh, Caesar can be a part of anything. And there's always challenges in the world. And you have to stand up and, and decide uh, when you get to that, what you call that crossroad or whatever, whether you're going to go right towards Caesar or left towards God. And I think that's, you know, what it is. Am I going to compromise myself and my belief just to do this? And that happens in all, I mean, in our jobs, in our personal relationship with people who want us to do uh, things that compromises what we believe in. And I think that uh, this plays a good part of that, you know, uh, in our thinking, in our thinking. You know, do do we go to Caesar because, um, because that, how far can do you cross that line? And it's what I'm just saying. We've all come to that, I think, crossroads where we have to stand up and say, no, that's not what I, you know, what I do. Uh, and then there's some of us who do cross that line because, um, and, and, and as we read the scriptures, we will see that too. Because we live in the world, it can be very enticing to want to be uh, worldly, you know, and, you know, to do those worldly things. And, in, and not stay true to who you are. And, and sometimes we have to find out, uh, we do that, and then we got to find our way back. Right, and sometimes it's just hard to know where the line is. So, you know, um, people may draw it at different places, in good faith might draw it in different places. Um, but in the end, I mean, ultimately, we always have to realize that we belong to God. And and you know for each of us we cross the line when we no longer see ourselves as gods um but really have adopted the ways of the world as you know the the ultimate uh um decider you know the ultimate standard um, before the rich it reminds me again of the about that you had with the person at the courthouse when you had to remove your collar when they... it's like you were saying when she, you know you're crossing the line now and i'm not taking off my car <laughs> right i mean that is really uh, that's really a good one um <laughs> you say that we we get to that and let you know people other people other situations define who we are and what we're supposed to be, you know, what we're supposed to be doing. And sometimes, like you just said, we, we cross that line. But then, uh, you know, then having crossed that line, there are times when you feel like you're drowning and, and then you try to, you know, you, you, you work at trying to find your way back to God. Yeah, yeah so it, I mean, we, we come across it all of the time. Um, so... But the, the lesson for us all is just remember, you do not belong to Caesar. You belong to God. You are not you are in the world, but you are not of the world. So um, let's go to see if we get another teaching in uh, for fun. This is a, this is a fun one. Uh, and uh, can also raise questions. So who would like to read uh, verses 18? through 27. I'll read. Go ahead. Okay. The question about the resurrection. Some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and put this question to him, saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us, if someone's brother dies leaving a wife, but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman and died, leaving no descendants. So the second married her and died, leaving no descendants. And the third likewise. And the seven left, and the seven 
left no descendants. Sorry, I have something on my screen. Last of all, the woman also died. At the resurrection, when they arise, whose wife will she be? For all seven brothers had been married to her. Jesus said to them, are you not misled because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but they are like the angels in heaven. As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, but, um, how God told him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly misled. All right. Okay. Initial reactions. That poor woman. That is powerful. <laughs> That poor woman, how come, Gwen? I was just thinking that she had to have all these um yeah, husbands. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's, a, that's a 20 um first century, whatever century. Um 21st century mindset looking at that. <laughs> well, but anyway, suppose they were all good luckers or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, because you know, um woman had no status back in those days where's pat pat not even here today right now um <laughs> women, had no, women had no status back in there and they had no way to provide for themselves so if their the husband died they had to go to and she was lucky that there were seven brothers that you know that could uh, you know provide for her after you know after that so um I, so that's it sounds like it sounds like the whole intent is to get that descendant the whole di oh right no. well yes i mean don't remember we're talking about an age where you know the whole purpose of marriage was to have you know to reproduce and have to, to have descendants um okay anything else that strikes you um was she a, a black widow and every time she got married she killed one <laughs> i don't know <laughs> she poisoned them somehow <laughs> all right but the um, but it, 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 it says to me, like so many people say, when they get to heaven, they're gonna look for their mama, their brother, their husband. But this answers the question: you will not have no relatives in heaven. All right, so that's a that's an interesting question, right? I mean, that is a concern that people raise all the time. You know, will will I have a husband in heaven? Exactly. You know? Um, nope. Okay, so that's a question. Any other any other thoughts that come to mind? Um, trying to trick Jesus again. Well, he, Jesus is talking to uh, people who don't believe in the resurrection. Okay, this is another so the trap. Question was just the question was observed. Okay, good. Yep. Any other thoughts before we jump in? No, uh, when he points out at the end, you know that that this is the God of um of the living, you know, not the God of the dead, and so he 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 he's definitely making a distinction about um well this, I'm I'm taking it as he's making a, a distinction about um an eternal life, you know. And and without without just say, talking, you know, without just saying raised after the dead, the dead, but making a distinction about a life that goes on forever. So that um okay, yeah. There's there's kind of two issues he's got to address here. So let's go back to what Loretta was saying. It's good. You always got to know who Jesus is talking to. So now he's talking to the Sadducees or Jesus, right? First the Pharisees, then the Herodians, and now the Sadducees. I mean, they're all out to get them. Now, what we we know about the Sadducees is that there is they do not believe in the resurrection. Um, are they Jews? Yes. 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 They're Jews. They're yes. Jews. They're Jews. But they, you know, not everybody, just like Christians today, not everybody believes in the same thing. 
And the, 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 as a general matter, Sadducees were Jews who did not believe there was a resurrection mm-hmm. from the dead. Right. Um, so, so they're going to, their question is going to sort of challenge his belief, right? Right. In the, in the resurrection of the dead. Right. And so he uses this rule that Moses puts on um, about marrying your brother's wife. Um, and do you think they really want to know the answer to that question? What do you? Th- why do you think they're using this as an example? Trap him again. Oh, to trap him again. Um. Why? Why is this a? If you didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, why is this a good question? If you don't believe in the resurrection of dead, then you don't believe in the sanctity of marriage. Mm. Well, actually, I, not I, I think it actually. I, go ahead. I think that they're, they're challenging whether or not he's following the laws of Moses. Okay, most, I, I mean. The, there is that, but I'm not so sure that's really at the heart of it. I, I think it goes to Loretta's point, but not challenging the sanctity of marriage, but but actually they believe in the sanctity of marriage. And if you and they're saying if you believe in the resurrection of the dead, that actually challenges the sanctity of marriage, because now all of a sudden at the resurrection, yeah. this, this woman has seven husbands. Yes. <laughs> you know, and how could that be? Uh, because for her to have seven husbands would be to violate God's law. So, so what they're doing is they're trying to, to, to make fun of the idea of the resurrection of the dead by saying if, if there really were a resurrection of the dead, then it would, it would result in this crazy um, situation in which a woman who married seven brothers under the law of Moses would end up being the wife of seven men, which would then break the law of Moses. Okay, so you see, you see what it's not so much a trap. I mean, it is a bit of a trap, but it's more it's done in a way to make fun of the resurrection, to say that the resurrection just doesn't make any sense because um of this situation so so what does jesus now has to answer two questions in order to 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 address what they ask so what are the two questions he's got to answer Um, that's a good question So he's got to answer, one, whether there really is a resurrection from the dead, okay. and two, what the resurrection of the dead is like, because that's okay. the only way he can respond to their challenge. Okay, so he answers the second question first and then answers the first question second. In other words, he first answers what the resurrection of the dead is like, and then he answers whether there is a resurrection of the dead. You see that? So, the first answer is what, it is, what the resurrection is like. So when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. So so at the resurrection of the dead, we're not like we are today. We're more like the angels in heaven. What does that mean to you? So to me, that means that we... I'm just saying we return to angels and angels we, we're, well, we're, like, we're like the angels. angels. She doesn't say we become angels. We're like the angels. So we're like the angels and we are serving God. We go back and we serve God. That's why I see it. Okay. What does it mean to be like angels? 
So D is saying, well, you serve God. That's one way you're like an angel. What's Does another way you might be like an angel? We belong to God. In no. that you belong to God. Although we belong to God the way we are right now. Well, in, in <laughs> heaven, uh, marriage, well, marriage uh, doesn't have any significance. Yeah, well, if you don't, yeah, if you if you look at it from the point of view that the primary purpose of marriage was to reproduce, right, raise, to 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 raise, to, you know, continue the race, we don't need to do that in heaven anymore, right? No, no, there's no, there's no need to marry and remarry or be given in marriage, you know, because there's no need to have offspring in heaven, uh, because there's no sexual significance, <laughs> because we're we're living. Forever. What else? What else might it mean to be like an angel? So, so I feel like an angel is um, like a spirit of goodness that's not attached, that but but also does serve God. Okay, so so maybe we don't have the same exactly the same kind of bodies, right? That we we have today. Right. And that would go back. That would go back to to uh, um, Loretta's comment about you know there's no need for sexual interaction. Maybe our bodies, you know, don't exist in the same way that that would have any meaning for us. So what gets me is what you just said. But they are like the angels in heaven. So like the angels in heaven, wouldn't we be angels? I mean, to me, that's the same thing. Are angels like and humans the, the same thing? I think it like we're like the angels in heaven. And so the angels in heaven are basically pure, but they also are, are, are there to be messengers and servants of God. So anything that we've read about angels prior, they, you know, they came to announce the good news. You know, they were doing God's work. They were there at the... Uh, to, to tell uh, or to announce doom at Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, well, I mean, let's let's I, I, play with it though. Are angels and humans the same thing? I, no. um, may, may I say that once you die and you are and you're in heaven, you're you're in God's kingdom. That your primary purpose and what you're primarily doing is worshiping and praising God, and so. All your earthly relationships are insignificant compared to that. Not saying okay. that we won't have some types of relationships, but they'll be insignificant compared to our primary purpose of worshiping and serving God. Right, or they won't function. They won't, our human relation, our earthly human relations won't function in the same way they do in heaven. Right? So that's what I tell when people say, you mean I'm not going to know my husband when I when I die? I mean, what's the point? And and I would say, no, you're going to know your husband and you're going to know that he's your husband. But your that relationship <clears throat> isn't going to function in the same way in heaven as it does on Earth. And and just as Gretchen says, and part of that is because your relationship with God is going who brings you all together you know, is going to be the primary relationship. So you're going to, you're going to know your husband, you're going to know your daughter and your sons, you're going to know your mother and your father through your union with God. You will know that they are there with you, but you won't, your relationship won't function in the same way. You won't have to, you're, you won't have to take care of your parents, you know, anymore because they're older than you. Um, or, you know, you won't um, have to um, go out on dates with your spouse because that's what you did, you know, when when you were in, in on Earth. Well, I want to get back to the other question because I think it's very important. Are humans and angels the same thing? No. 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 They are not. And who's higher, angels or humans? Angels. That's right. What is man, Lord, that she would you care for him, that you made him a little higher than the angels? Yes, that is said that. Okay. 
So, I mean, it's very important because we tend to see angels so almost because they're, they're, you know, one huge difference between humans and angels that he, angels are pure spirit, right? They, they have no corporal body like we have. Um, they are pure spirit. There's debates, most the kind of the contemporary debate is the, at least the angels in heaven have no will of their own. They are simply an extension of God. Uh, and they can only do God's will. Um, they they can't do anything else. Whereas as humans, we were blessed with free will. Um, you know, that's a blessing. Of course, if we don't exercise it well, it becomes a curse. But but that's another distinction between us and angels is that God has created us in his image. The angels are not created in the image of God. We are created in the image of God. So does that mean we lose our status when we, get, uh, when we die? <laughs> well, no, but that's why I, I look at it, the language of you are like the angels okay. becomes very important. If he doesn't say we become angels in heaven, he said like the angels. We like the angels. So then you have to ask, well, what are angels like, <laughs> and 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 how do we become like that without actually becoming that? Okay, so it's it's an analogy, and so so I think that's very important. So basically just so that we don't we can finish in the few, next few minutes basically what he's saying is that there's a transformation a change that occurs at the resurrection of the dead okay we are still who we are our identities remain but our way of being changes okay so we're no longer like the, we're no longer existing the way we are here on earth. We're, we're going to exist more like the way the angels exist in heaven. Okay, that it doesn't mean we're going to be angels, but we're going to be more like them in the way that we exist. And so I would almost say that the way I think we're like angels is not that we become pure spirit. Remember, we, our body is changed at the resurrection, even to a glorified body, just like Jesus's body is a glorified body. So we don't lose our body. It just becomes different in its manifestation. But I think we become more like angels in, this, in the sense that we are united to God in a way that we aren't united to God here on earth. You know, we, we, we become so intimate and close to God that we are like the angels who are one with God. Question? Mm -hmm. So, um, and and it might be my ignorance that um, I don't have an, that I'm asking a question. When we are with God, do we lose our free will? And if we don't lose our free will, why would there be no rebellion in heaven? Because our free will causes rebe rebellion. Well, that's a that's a, good, a great <laughs> theological question. Yes, it is. Uh, let me and, let me unmute. Um, and you know what what I would say is that we retain our free will because we um, we re, you know we we still are humans, um, but that because we are so one with God and one with another, it wouldn't in essence occur to us to choose something apart from god okay so could we um i guess we could um but would we probably you know my sense is no we wouldn't because we are so united with god that i mean the reason often that we <laughs> choose against god in this world is that we are not thoroughly united with him we're not you know fully united and so we get tempted and confused and, you know, we're, we're subject to the, you know, the devil and all that kind of stuff. I think once we are fully united with God in heaven, all of those distractions are taken away and there's no reason why we would, um, we would choose other. 
But I mean, no one really knows, but that's how I would answer that question. I, I think we, we remain fundamentally human, but, and we retain human characteristics, but we are transformed to be fully united with God and one and another. So we live our humanity out in a way that we can't possibly live it out in this world. Okay. So let's, um, let's go real quick. Let me just know, go real quick. It, oh, uh, so can I just say something quickly? Uh-huh. When you said, when she said, um, when you were talking about how we come fully united with God, it just made me think about how do you, and this is a whole new other um, Bible study class probably, but it made me think about, well, how do you minister to those who um, don't come fully united with God? I mean, there are reasons that people are not fully united with God. And, you know, we can at some point discuss the reasons, but I'm just wondering, well, how do you minister to them? To that, how do you okay. bring them closer to God? Yeah, and that's I, a whole new different Bible. Right. <laughs> but I would say again, just by virtue of us, of us being in this world, in this body, none of us is fully united with God. Okay, we, we just we just can't do it because of the limitations that the world and our being in the world, um, you know, impose on us. But once we're at, we're at the resurrection and we are transformed uh, into a glorified body in heaven. We are united with God and with one another in a different way and, and in the fullness of, of ways. So, so, so that's why said, that's what it's like at the resurrection. So that answers their question about the seven husbands and the one wife. But then, uh, I have a question. Maybe we can talk about it next week. I know we're running out of time, but us being a little higher than the angels, would that with the rebellion, the quote unquote rebellion that was in heaven when there were angels cast out of heaven and thus the creation of Satan? Well, you know, again, you have to realize none of that is scriptural. Um, so, you know, there are there are ongoing debates as to whether that is in fact what really happened okay so if you stick with the scriptures we don't know anything about how satan came about you know and how the you know those kinds of things a lot of that that the rebellion and all that is is really folklore that's been passed down but it's not in the scriptures Okay, so you, if you read your scriptures, you won't find anything about a rebellion in heaven. Um, so, so the, the, that's the difficulty with those things, um, you know. And if Jesus is going to stick with the scriptures, which is what he does, how he answers the question is interesting, because in the scriptures in the Old Testament, you know, with, that Jesus was working with, there is no reference to a resurrection of the dead. Okay, it's not in there. You could go back and read your Old Testament. You can read it from cover to cover. If you read the the what Jesus would have read, um, and um, no no resurrection in there. Um, so how does he interpret the scriptures to allow for the resurrection of the dead? And he uses this line of when when God when Moses you know, confronts God and God says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Okay. And the significance is the verb I am. In other words, God does not introduce himself to Moses by saying, I was the God of Abraham and I was the God of Isaac and I was the God of Jacob, but I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac and I am the God of Jacob. So what does that imply about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Still that they alive. still live. That they still live. Right. Right. And that's why he still is their God. 
he he wasn't i mean he was their god but he's not just was their god he also is their god and and that's the scripture passage that jesus has to use to justify the resurrection of the dead because if i am the god of abraham i am the god of isaac i am the god of jacob then he is not the god of the dead but the god of the living and the living okay that is so powerful. I mean, to n just think about that death will not end your personal existence. That is. And you will not, it, it will not end your relationship with God. Right. right? God yeah. is still your God, whether, yes. you know, you're living or whether you're dead. And the okay. other thing is, he says, the last little line that he says, which applies to all of us, too. Even though they read that, they were greatly misled. You are greatly misled. Right, in their understanding of what the resurrection is. Right. Yeah. They they read it, but they didn't understand it. The they, same they, as we. Right. right. So, so that's, you know, the whole, it's a lot on the resurrection. But remember, Jesus is answering two questions. One, is there a resurrection? And yes, there is, because God is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, which means he's not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. That answers the question, is there a resurrection? And the answer is yes. And then the, they, when they rise from the dead, they neither are married nor given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. That's what it's like at the resurrection of the dead, okay? So that's how we live at the resurrection. So there's two questions he's answering. Okay, so let's uh, uh, call that quits for today. And um, we will take it up from here next week.